just open in prayer. I so depend on the Lord to help me, and he's given me a beautiful message. But I don't ever stand behind this pulpit and not know that it's God that I need. Yeah. You don't want to hear from me, right? You don't. I don't even want to hear from me. But when the anointing comes on us, yes. something changes. And then the Holy Spirit begins to flow yes. and work through his vessels. Yes. And you know, it doesn't matter whether the vessel's a female or a male. God once told me it's what's in the glass that matters. It's what's in the vessel that counts. I mean, if you're in a desert and you're thirsty, you won't care whether you're drinking from a Dixie cup or whether you're drinking from a golden goblet. And if we would keep our eyes on what's in the vessel and what comes out of the vessel and not on the vessel, we wouldn't have any problems because there is no male or female, the Bible says. But, Lord, I need you. Lord, I've heard from your Holy Spirit as I was preparing this message and you were directing me, Lord. But I need you, God, to direct me now. Holy Spirit, I need you to speak through me today. And I ask you from the bottom of my heart, Lord, that you would speak your word through this mouth, these lips, Lord, and that there would be something changing in our life today. Lord, that there would be a place that we can reach that we've never reached before, and a closeness, a closeness to you, Father, and a closeness to you, Jesus, and a closeness to you, Holy Spirit, that we've not yet experienced, because God, I know there's more. Reveal yourself here, Lord, today, because we've all come in with the same purpose. We've all come in to honor you, to reverence you, to worship you. So have your way here, Lord. Do whatever you want to do. Direct me any way you want, Lord. Because this is about you, not about man, not about woman. This is what you desire in this sanctuary. That's what we want here today, Lord. And I thank you, and I give you honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, if ever I was going to title a message, and I don't always give a title, but if I was going to title this message that God gave me today, the title is, Do You Want to Go Deeper? Do you want to go through the curtain, the veil of the tabernacle we're going to be talking about today? And you know, I was hearing the Lord this week just put this message together and I went into my office, my study, and the curtains were closed and I went to open the curtains to let the light in. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said to me, ask them, do they want to go through the curtain? I said, wow, God, thanks. And that's what God is asking us today. Really, the question is, how deep do you want to go? How much do you long to experience the wonders of God? The spiritual things of God. You see, it's not about formality, and that you're not going to find here. To the best that I can do, I don't like formality. I don't like let's do A, B, C, D, and then we're going to do E, F, G. No, we're going to do whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you want. And now it's time to hear the word. Because there's power in that word. But God wants to take us into the holy of holies. That veil has been rent. And God wants to bring each one of us to a more mature place in the Lord. Because not one of us here have arrived. No matter how long we've walked with the Lord. I look and I've, I've been walking with the Lord 
68 years since I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I remember the day. I remember the hour. I remember the time. I was a little girl, but I asked Jesus in my heart because I wanted so much to be loved, and I heard that he loved me. But even in 68 years, the more I learn of his word, the more I know I don't know. And the more I depend on him to grow me more and show me more. Yes. But I have to be willing, and we have to be willing, to step out of ourselves and not worry about what someone around us thinks. When you start being concerned about what somebody around you thinks, you'll never enter into the glory of God. You'll never enter into the presence of God because you're too self-absorbed at that point. And in order to enter into the presence of God, you've got to be God-absorbed, not self-absorbed. Amen? So I'm going to be reading from Psalm 91 because Moses penned by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, a beautiful psalm. And we're only going to read a couple of verses here. We see that in the Psalms, Moses is attributed with writing Psalm 90 and Psalm 91. And we're going to be reading some of the verses from Psalm 91. He wrote this psalm when he was in the wilderness, going through that wilderness experience, going through the trials, going through the times of the complaining of the Israelites, going through a time of needing God more than ever to lead these people. And this is what he wrote. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress my God, in him I will trust. Moses was saying, I took the people out of Egypt by the power of the almighty God. I took them away from all those Egyptian gods that we were talking about in Sunday school. Isn't that beautiful how God brings us all together? I wasn't even thinking that. Didn't even know what Sunday school was about this morning. But God is Moses' God. He's declaring, you are my God. There's no God like Jehovah. Yes. Amen. He's our God today. And there's a secret place. There is a place that we can enter into where we close out everything around us. It might be your prayer closet. It might be lying on your bed at night. It might be going down the highway even. Though it's kind of hard to get deep in the spiritual realm, it's better to watch where you're going, amen? It's better to get behind a closed door and get alone with God. You see, the Bible tells us many times Jesus got alone with God. He went up to the mountain. He left the disciples and had to get alone with God, his Father. And this is what Moses is talking about. He's talking about behind the veil of the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. Behind that veil is a secret place, a place where the glory of God rests, a place unlike any other place in the tabernacle. It was called the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy place. And in that place, he said he would abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So let me explain a little bit about the tabernacle today. And we see in the tabernacle that there are many types and many shadows or, or many revelations when you study the tabernacle, you will see so many revelations there in everything God did concerning the tabernacle and what he told Moses to build. Everything in the tabernacle points to Jesus. Yes. But there also, as we go into the tabernacle, it shows types and shadows. And one of the types and shadows it shows in the tabernacle 
is the Christian's growth. So we see in the tabernacle, and I'll do a little bit of teaching here today, we see in the tabernacle there's three divisions. We have the outer court, we have the inner court, or the holy place, and then we have the holy of holies, or the most holy place. There's three divisions in the tabernacle. And those three divisions give us an insight in the growth of our Christian life. We see that in order to get into the first division, you got to enter through the gate. And in our life, as we're wandering about, before we knew Jesus Christ as our Savior, we had to make a decision. God brought us to a place of decision of what gate we wanted to eternally go through. There are gates of heaven and there are gates of hell. But we make the decision by the power and the drawing of the Holy Spirit which gate we want to go through. And in the tabernacle, they entered the gates into the outer court. And as we enter the gate in our spiritual realm, because we haven't yet entered the gates of heaven, but we know our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we know that's waiting for us. So in the spiritual realm, we've entered that gate. We've said yes to Jesus. We've recognized what he's done for us on the cross, and we haven't turned him aside. But Jesus warns that narrow is that gate, yes. and few find it. But we enter then as Christians into the first gate, accepting Jesus Christ. This is the beginning of our walk with God. This is the beginning of our steps with God. And when we get into the outer court, there's two pieces of furniture there. Altogether, there's six pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. And if you look at the position of the pieces of furniture in the tabernacle, the brazen altar, the laver, the candlestick, the table of showbread, the golden altar or altar of incense, and then that beautiful golden ark, what do they form? A cross. They're in the position of the cross. Jesus is everywhere in the tabernacle. Well, as you go through to the outer court, you're going to come to the brazen altar. And that's where you recognize the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has done for you. Now, we know in the tabernacle they were sacrificing lambs and bulls and, and rams according to a forerunning of what was about to come. They didn't really understand completely that Jesus Christ the Messiah would come. But they knew that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Because we have died, you've got to have life. Yes. Jesus Christ is life. God the Father is life. Yes. Salvation is receiving life within you because you're dead without the life of Jesus Christ. So the first piece of furniture in that out of court was recognizing the sacrifice that Jesus Christ makes for you. And then we come to the laver where the priest would wash their hands. And it's a place of cleansing. And it represents in the Christian's life the baptism in water. Now this is just one of the types it would take me months to teach you the tabernacle for every type that that labor represents. But we're going through this as the growth of a Christian's life. So this is how we're going to apply it today, to the type of growth in a Christian's life. So we recognize the sacrifice with the brazen altar, and we recognize being baptized in water, being associated with Christ in his death, and rising again with him. So that's the first stage of a Christian's walk with God. 
and some Christians remain in the outer court. Have you ever seen Christians that accept Christ and even go ahead and get baptized, but they don't seem to grow any further? They don't get into church. They think they got their ticket now and it's okay, that's the end, but it doesn't end there. There are three stages in a Christian's life that God wants to bring us to, and he doesn't want you to remain in the outer court, amen? Well, the next stage, we went through the gate to get into the outer court. The next stage is we must go through the door to get into the inner court. And who is the door? Jesus Christ. He declares himself to be the door to go into the inner court, to go into a second phase of our salvation experience where we begin to grow. So what do we see in the inner court? We see the golden uh, lampstand. Now notice something. In the outer court, there's no covering over it. The light that you get in the outer court is natural light. But when you step into the inner court, it's covered with badger skins. It's covered with three particular coverings, and I'm not going to go into them today. Like I said, we could be here all day, but it's covered. So the only light that you're getting when you go into the inner court is the light of the golden candlestick, which represents Jesus Christ. He is the center, and we are the branches. He calls himself the branch. He's, he's the, we're, we're the branches off that vine. He's the vine, we're the branches, amen? amen? And so, when we step into the inner court, we step into an experience of illumination. Illumination in our lives through the word of God. We go from that outer court of accepting him and being baptized to begin to see the light of God and the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And as we study the word and grow in the word, our spirits become enlightened with the word. And that lamp and that light, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And the more of Jesus you take into your spirit, the more you'll become like him. The more you'll shine like him. And then they'll over across from the lampstand, which, by the way, inside that inner court, the walls were glowing with gold. And so that light was reflecting everywhere. Could you imagine the beauty of that? And then... On the other side is a table of showbread. There were 12 pieces of bread in two stacks, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, representing the 12 disciples that were to come, representing 12, which is God's divine government. But the table of showbread represents Jesus Christ. He's the living bread come down from heaven. And what it's showing here, that as we get into that inner core, we must eat his body, as he said. We must recognize him as the bread. We must know that man cannot live by natural bread alone, but, out of every, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He is the manna, the living bread. And how beautiful in our Christian lives when we begin to eat the word, like Jeremiah said, eat the word of God. For when we take in the word of God and devour the word of God, when we take communion representing Jesus' body and his blood, Things begin to change in our life. We begin to mature in our life. We begin to grow closer to Jesus in our life as we recognize what he did for us more intimately on the cross. And then lastly, in the inner court, right in front of the veil, is a very important piece of furniture. That piece of furniture is called the golden altar. 
or the altar of incense. Oh, I could spend a long time on that, but I can't today. But the golden altar of incense, the incense was made up of certain ingredients, and those ingredients represented our prayer life. It was made up of stachna, which is something that you just take from the tree, little nodules come on the tree, and you just cut it off, it freely comes, and God was trying to show us in the ingredients of that incense that we must freely come to Jesus in prayer. It was made of gilbanum, which was found in the deeps of the Red Sea. It was a shell that gave off a, a beautiful aroma. And when they crushed that, God was trying to tell us that we must come from the depths of our heart, because they found that shell from the depths of the Red Sea, that we must come in prayer, not only freely, but from the depths of our hearts. And each one of those ingredients showed us something. There were five, uh, there was uh, the stachna, the gilbanum, the, uh, oh, I don't have it in front of me, frankincense, salt, put it all together. But all those things represented a deep prayer life and a prayer life that when we're praying to Lord, the Lord that we're crushed. But when we come to that altar of incense, in the maturity of our Christian life, that is the place where we mature in prayer. That is the place where our prayer life deepens. That is the place where if we've not been baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that we come to that place of a spiritual awareness that we can't pray the way we need to pray and we need the Holy Spirit to flow through our mouths and to pray through us. That altar of incense also represents that our our Savior, Jesus Christ, is ever living to intercede for us. So when we're in that inner court, we're experiencing a deeper, deeper prayer life, not only in our own language, but allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives. You see, you won't be able to be baptized in the Holy Spirit until you mature to the place where you want all of God. And so many will come to me and say, I want that, but then they don't yet receive it because they possibly are still in the outer court. Or possibly they're still being enlightened and don't understand it. Or possibly they haven't eaten enough of the word to understand what it is from the table of Sherbet. So they haven't progressed to that last piece of furniture in the inner court. Oh, but when we get there, Oh, that when the Spirit of God intercedes through us. Oh, but when that power of God flows through us to defeat the enemy, we grow in a way that we've never experienced before. It enlightens us and causes something to rise up. The Holy Spirit rises up within us and gives us a power that we were not aware of, an experience that we were never aware of, a step in God that will change your life. Change your life. You know, the priest, the high priest, was allowed to go through the veil once a year, just once a year, into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And I want you to think about this a minute. I want you to meditate on this. The Bible says that in one hand he held the censer, and in the other hand he had to hold the incense. That's what the Bible told him to do. Put the incense in one hand, the censer in the other. Okay, I want you to, well, I'd step down from here, but then Facebook won't see. But I want you to picture this. Here's the priest. In one hand, he's got the censer. In the other hand, he's got the incense. And now he's standing before the veil. How is he ever going to get through? He's not going to turn around and put his butt to it. He's not going to try to take his elbow and push through it. Because he's got a censer in his hand, an incense in his hand, that he's going to burn. The Bible says that this was the most beautiful moment 
that he was to offer up the sacrifice of praise. Now, some of us have been mistaught about the sacrifice of praise. It's a sacrifice that he was going to offer to God. But some of us have mistaken that and said, when I don't want to praise God and I'm really tired, I'm going to give him the sacrifice of praise. Well, bear with me, folks. God doesn't take anything from you that you don't willingly give. Your prayers must come willingly. Your prayers must be deep. And your praise must come willingly. So when we say sacrifice of praise and sacrifice of prayer, the Bible's not referring to praying when you don't want to. Because God doesn't make you do anything you don't want to. He doesn't even make you accept him if you don't want to. He won't make you be filled with the Holy Spirit if you don't want to. He won't make you go through the gate if you don't want to. And he won't make you go through the door if you don't want to. And he won't make you go through the veil if you don't want to. You see, you can remain in what room of the tabernacle you want to remain. Oh, but as the priest began to offer up the sacrifice of praise, Jewish tradition has it that the veil opened, miraculously opened, so they could walk into the most holy place. And though I don't see it here in the word, I believe it to be so. It stands to reason, doesn't it? And what does it teach us? That our praises open up to the presence of God. And so should we not learn to praise God in the sense that no one can make you praise God? It's got to come from within. We've been learning on Friday nights. We've been going through all different Bible studies, a whole series on praise and worship and how it ushers you into the presence of God. The more you can enter in with that praise, the deeper experience you'll have with God, the more he'll touch you, the more, like Moses said, you enter into that secret place. If this pastor had one desire, one thing to see, Lord, and you know this is the prayer of my heart, if there was one thing that my life could impact on those that God has entrusted me to feed, it would be for them to grow deeper. I have experienced things in the spiritual realm that are so precious, but there is so much more. I want to go deeper. I'm not content in the outer court for sure, and I'm certainly not content even in the inner court. I want to go right through that veil, right in front of that Ark of the Covenant. Now as the high priest went into and through that veil once a year. That holy of holies place was covered. There was no light of the candlestick in there. So the light that was in the most holy place was the glory of God. That's the light I want to step into, the glory of God. That's what I'd love to see our church step into, the glory of God. You might say, well, you don't see that too much anymore, or hear that too much, that was from back in the days of Israel. No, it wasn't. I attended a church one time where a woman died, and I've told you this story, but they haven't heard it. A woman died. And it was a very unusual service because God had instructed the pastor to wear a robe and he never wore a robe when he preached and he questioned God and said, are you sure? And God said, yes, I want you to wear a robe and preach on touch the hem of my garment service. And so he wore the robe in obedience and this was a very big church. Thousands of people were there in New York. And in came this woman who was a nurse and she wasn't supposed to be there that day, but she got off from work in an unusual way. God was ordering her footsteps and she went into church and she's sitting next to this person. And as we're all worshiping God and feeling the presence of God engulfing that house of the Lord, the woman fell in the aisle, dead. 
Now, nobody even noticed because the power of God was so great, hardly anyone could stand up anyway. The glory of God was in that place. It was hard to stand under the presence of God. And we see that in here in occasion, but I want to see it more. And what happened was the nurse bent down next to her, sensing something was wrong, and the woman's eyes were rolled back in their head. And the nurse looked and motioned for the pastor to come through the crowd, and she said, he's, she's dead. She's not slaying the spirit, as they call it. She's dead. Her eyes are rolled back. And somebody grabbed the hem of that pastor's robe that was kneeling next to the dead woman and shoved it in her hand and closed her hand on the robe and her whole body began to shake and she came back to life, folks. And a light came down from the ceiling and I have a picture of that for anyone that wants to see it. I'll, I'll show you. A light came down from the ceiling and anyone that walked through that light got healed that night. And some said they actually saw angelic beings standing on the either side of the light. God still does these things, but it's not him that's hindering it. It's us that's hindering it. Because we don't want to go through into the most holy place. We're so hesitant to worry about what Susie might think over here or Johnny might think over there if I start praising the Lord and get a little loud or a little noisy. We gotta be quiet in the house of God. Oh no, we learned last Friday that heaven is a loud place. There is a time to be quiet. There is a time to reverence God. The Bible says there was a, a space of a half hour in heaven in Revelation that it was quiet. But what's happened is they've thrown the baby out with the bath water, so to speak, here. We've got churches that are so into formalism and doing everything so methodically that the Holy Spirit has no chance to do anything. We go into churches, and they may not like hearing this, but I'm going to preach what God tells me and what I feel in my heart. There's so many beams of light coming down from the ceiling in red and blue and gold and flashing as they're worshiping God that if there was a divine visitation of a beam of light, a cloud of light come in the sanctuary, they wouldn't even recognize it as God. They're so into doing it man's way and not God's way. And I want so much to see this church go through the veil. I want so much for the Lord to have such freedom in here that when people come up for prayer, they can't stand under the anointing of God. So when you go into the last place, when you go into the Holy of Holies, something beautiful happens there. You go through the veil and you enter into the light of God, the glory of God. But Moses told us something else. So let's read Exodus 25. Turn with me quick and to Exodus 25, verse 8. And we're going to see a couple things in Exodus 25. First off, that God wants so much for us to want to go through the veil. God wants so much to visit us. God wants so much to fellowship with us. It's not him that's holding back, folks. It's us. In verse 8 of Exodus 25, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. God wants to dwell among us. Jesus Christ wants to touch and heal. Jesus Christ wants to come into our sanctuaries and save the lost if we give them space to do it. And we will. At the Way Church, I love the name, the Way Church, because we're going to let God have his way. The way is his way here, not our way. And then God speaks to Moses and gives him a pattern of making the Ark of the Covenant. And we're not going to get into all of that, but I want you to go to verse 20, where it begins to describe that Ark of the Covenant. And it's describing the mercy seat that was placed on top of the ark. 
And it says in verse 20, and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. Now if you look in Ezekiel, you'll see the cherubims and their wings are touching. As you read what Ezekiel saw, he said there were cherubims and they were crying out to God, worshiping God, and their wings were touching. And then God says, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give you. Now what was in the ark? Eventually, in the ark we saw the Ten Commandments. We saw Aaron's rod that budded, and then we saw the manna. Each one of these things depicting Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the law, the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. The branch that budded represents death coming to life, and Jesus Christ knew that we were dead, and his resurrection, his death, came to life. And we also are dead in sins and dead in the body, but we will come to life in the resurrection just like him. That's what Aaron's rod represented. Resurrection, life, hallelujah. And the manna, manna means what is it? That was Jesus Christ, the living bread. But you see the Jews, the Jews didn't understand what it was. What is it? That's what manna means. And the Jews are still saying in Israel, we don't believe this Messiah, is Je that Jesus is this Messiah. They don't recognize what is it. It is Jesus, the Lamb of God. But they still have their faces veiled, and they can't see through the veil. They're still in the outer court, and maybe even the inner court, in their Jewish experience. But they haven't gone through the veil to see. He's the living bread. He's the what is it manner. Now look at verse 21, and this goes back to Psalm 91. God says, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with you, and I will commune or talk with you from above the mercy seat. Now, folks, what happens when you get above? I want you to picture the mercy seat. I want you to picture the light and glory of God, and he's above the mercy seat. What does it do? It makes a shadow. It casts a shadow. The mercy seat is a shadow. A shadow of things to come. Yes. A shadow of God's mercy. Yes. And we see that here in Psalm 91, I'll go back just quickly. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the holy of holies of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Moses was saying, I get in the shadow. I can't touch the ark. They couldn't touch it. They would die. But he could get in the shadow of the Almighty and have a spiritual experience with God unlike any earthly experience you would ever want. You see, God has a way of overshadowing us did the word not say that when Mary asked Gabriel, how will these things be that I should be pregnant, I'm a virgin? What did he respond? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you. She knew what overshadowing meant. Yes. She knew the moment she got pregnant, folks. It wasn't like maybe am I pregnant or not. He overshadowed her. The Spirit of God overshadowed her. The presence of the Holy Spirit had permeated the most holy place. The glory of God had permeated that place. Now let me
me show you something else. Go with me to 2 Chronicles 5. Let me show you what else happens when the Holy Spirit touches us and we allow ourselves to empty ourselves out and we allow ourselves to go through that veil and we long with all our heart to have more of God. We look in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 5, verse 13 through 14. Look what happens when the glory of God comes into place. I want to see God's glory come in this place. How about you? Amen? Amen. I don't play with God. I'm so serious about God. It came even to pass at the trumpeters. Now they're dedicating Solomon's temple. And it came to pass that the trumpeters and the singers were as one or in one accord to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good for his mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, the, the house of Solomon, the temple of Solomon became filled with the glory of the Lord. The same cloud that was over the tabernacle in the wilderness came into Solomon's house. And look what the results were. So that the priests, could not stand up, the Hebrew version says, to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Notice what was happening here. They were all in one accord. Yes. They were all praising God with one voice. Mm -hmm. Everyone was on the same page. Everyone was longing for God. Everyone was praising and honoring God. They were excited about the temple. They were excited that it was completed. They were excited that it was so beautiful and they were going to dedicate it to God. And so in one accord, with one excitement, they lifted up their voices and praised the Lord. And the cloud returned to the temple of Solomon as it had been in the tabernacle. And they could not stand up. You see, when the glory of God comes in and the presence of God comes into the sanctuary, you can't stand. I neglected to say that when that woman got raised from the dead, my dad was there. He was telling me that he held on to the pew because when the power of God came over that woman and began to shake her, everyone in the immediate area fell on the floor. They couldn't stand up. There was a weight of the glory of God. And he said he held on to the pew for dear life because it was pushing him down. Have you ever heard about that? The weight of the glory of God? As you begin to worship him, you'll feel this presence that's such a beautiful weight. It's not a weight that constrains you. It's not a weight that controls you because God will never control you. But as you yield to him, as you're under his presence on the floor, even as you're worshiping him through the house, you can feel the weight of his glory come in. That's what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. They came up looking for Jesus and they said, where? They, they were looking and Jesus looked at them in John 8, 4 through 6. He says, who are you looking for? Now he knew. And they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And they fell backwards. The Bible says in John, verse 6, they fell backwards. He said, I am. I am. And they fell backwards. He announced who he was. And they fell backwards in his presence. The angels praise God. Everything that has breath praises God. How much more ought we to praise the living God? Amen. God is calling us 
He's calling us to say, there's more than the outer core, children. There's even more than the inner core, even though I've met you there and you've had so many beautiful times with me. The Bible tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent. The Bible tells us we can go boldly into the presence of God and make our requests known. But it's not just to go in there to make our requests known. It's to boldly go into his presence to worship him in a way we've maybe not worshiped him yet. In a way where we've let our own selfishness be emptied out and allow the Holy Spirit to totally fill us. There are many fillings of the Holy Spirit. You might say, well, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I speak in tongues. That is beautiful. But do you know you can be filled and filled and filled and filled again? There's refillings of the Holy Spirit. There's anointings that come on us. And my heart's cry is, give it all to me, Lord. Whatever you got, I want it. Because when I get to heaven, I'm going to experience his spirit in a beautiful way. Why not begin to experience it here? It's what he wants. It's not getting emotional. But why would it be wrong to get emotional? Because emotions are a gift of God. God has emotions. The Bible says he's gotten angry. The Bible says that it grieved him at his heart, that he made man. You best believe that your emotions are just a pattern of the emotions of God. So when you go into churches now, a lot of times they say, don't get so emotional. When you come through our doors, this pastor said, to say, get as emotional as you want as long as you're in the Lord. We won't stand for a counterfeit. We don't want you making yourself where you're trying to get everybody to look at you. But if you've got your eyes on him, you won't care who's looking at you, who's not looking at you, when you get in the presence of God. But what's happened is the devil has robbed the church of the divine spiritual experiences of God by making us so self-centered instead of God-centered. But again, in the way church, we want God to have his way. So I'm going to do something very extraordinary, something I've never done before, and I'm going to say goodbye to our Facebook friends, and I'm going to do something with you here that I think will touch your hearts in closing. Praise God. God bless you all that are watching.